Hello guys, welcome back to another video here on my channel, Medicosis Omar. Today I am going to be explaining the inflammatory pathway. Starting off, I'm going to be drawing the cell, the most basic unit of life. I'm going to be drawing the cell membrane here in pink, and we are going to be zooming in on the cell membrane. Okay, zooming in on the cell membrane, I'm going to be identifying the, the phospholipid bilayer. And this phospholipid bilayer is this fluid mosaic model that allows it to bilaterally diffuse through the entire cell. The green parts are the, uh, the glycerol heads, the polar glycerol heads that face both the extracellular matrix and the cytosol. On the inside of the phospholipid bilayer, we have these two fatty acid tails represented in blue for each glycerol head. And that's the hydrophobic region of the phospholipid bilayer. And inside here, we have the yellow parts, which are going to represent the cholesterol, which modulate membrane fluidity. Okay, now zooming in on the green polar heads, that is the glycerol that I was talking about. So I'm going to be drawing glycerol. I'm just going to be moving this to the side real quick. Okay, so glycerol is this three carbon polar molecule. So what makes this unique is that it's able to face the polar areas, such as the cytosol and the extracellular matrix, and it's bound to on one carbon, a phosphate group, and on the other two carbons, it's bound to a fatty acid tail via an ester linkage. And this entire head group is called a phosphidate. Here, I'm going to be zooming in on phosphatidyl inositol 45 bisphosphate. Via phospholipase C cleavage at this phosphate group, we are able to get this IP3 molecule. And this is via the GQ pathway, usually acts to increase calcium via the endoplasmic reticulum, releasing that. The what's remaining is this diacylglycerol. I made a mistake here, it's not PIP2 diacylglycerol. And this works to activate protein kinase C in the membrane via the, G, via the GQ pathway. So this remains in the plasma membrane because of its hydrophobic component, while the IP3 due to all the OHs and phosphate is polar and diffuses in the cytosol to go to the endoplasmic reticulum to release more calcium, which usually increases vesicle fusion and things of that sort. So inflammation, we usually have this phospholipase A2 cleavage, which cleaves this arachidone acid, fatty acid tail. So a fun fact about arachidone is actually that a lot of snake venom which causes inflammation, actually contains phospholipase A2 as a key modulator enzyme. And this basically releases that free fatty acid, the arachidine, to increase the inflammatory pathway. And the free fatty acid acts as a natural detergent that leads to tissue damage, essentially. Because the free fatty acid has both a hydrophobic and hydrophilic region, it is able to... It is able to act in this soap-like mechanism. So essentially the PLA2 will release a free fatty acid and a lysophospholipid, which only contains one fatty acid chain. This lysophospholipid is amphipathic and is basically able to disrupt the lipid bilayer, leading to increased cell permeability and cell lysis. So here I'm drawing another cell zoom in of the cell membrane, and this is gonna be the G-coupled protein receptor. I'm just drawing the seven trans uh, membrane domains with the N-terminus facing outside and the C-terminus facing inside, where it's gonna interact with the G, the heterotrimeric G proteins. So this is an example of a ligand basically binding to that GPCR and activating it. Here I'm drawing the GA subunit, so this is going to be the GA subunit where GTP basically binds in the active site and gets hydrolyzed uh, to GDP when we want to inactivate it. And here we have the beta and gamma subunits which are attached to the membrane via cysteine residue through per, uh, prenylation. So essentially now that this G-coupled protein receptor is active, it activates phospholipase A2. And phospholipase A2 cleaves phospholipids at that SN2 position, releasing arachidonic acid. So I'm just going to draw that right there. So arachidonic acid basically serves as this key precursor in the inflammatory cascade. This is where it gets interesting. We're able to branch off into two different pathways. First here via lipoxygenase, we are going to branch into the leukotriene pathway. And leukotrienes are essentially these very powerful signaling molecules that play a crucial role in inflammation by promoting bronchoconstriction, increased vascular permeability, and immune cell recruitment. So basically we see that these leukotrienes are key mediators in inflammation. How do we see this? Like I said, bronchoconstriction via smooth muscles in the airway. And we also see that they attract other white blood cells. That's that chemokine type of factor. So that's an example of a white blood cell, usually a monocyte or a macrophage. And we see this is a key in the late phase allergic reaction of type 1 immunopathologies as they basically act as isinophil chemotactic factors of anaphylaxis along with prostaglandins. And these ECFAs basically attract azinophils, which increase major bro uh, basic protein, and this ends up increasing inflammation. Now, 
going back, we're going to branch off into the other pathway, which is going to be via cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. So both COX1 and COX2 basically convert arachidonic acid into prostaglandin H2 or PGH2. PGH2 basically, when prostaglandins were actually first discovered, a fun fact about it is that scientists thought that they came from the prostate gland, hence the name, but we end up finding out that they don't just come from the prostate, they play a much bigger role in the body regulating inflammation, fever, blood clotting, and even stomach protection, which I'm going to touch on right now. Right here, I am drawing what this prostaglandin H2 is able to branch off into. And via prostacyclin synthase, we can make prostacyclin or prostaglandin I2. So prostacyclin or prostaglandin I2 and PGH or PGH could also via PGH, PGE isomerase can make prostaglandin E2 which is considered the multitasker, and I'm going to uh, touch base on this even more in a little bit. And finally, they uh, can also make thromboxane, or thromboxane A2 specifically for platelets via thromboxane synthase, as we can see in this molecule right here, and I will also explain that a bit more. Okay, wonderful. So now zooming out, we get this nice overview of the entire pathway and how it connects to the phospholipase A2 cleavage at the SN2 site. So now I'm going to go more in detail about prostacyclin and or prostaglandin I2. So prostacyclin and prostaglandin I2 is considered the blood clot preventer. And essentially what it does is that it inhibits platelet aggregation or preventing blood clots from forming, dilates blood vessels, improving blood flow, and reduces inflammation and endothelial cells. So it can act in this antagonistic mechanism to thromboxane. Now, prostaglandin E2 here is considered the multitasker and basically is able to regulate fevers and inflammation, basically triggering the hypothalamus to increase body temperature, protects the stomach lining by stimulating mucus production, and regulates smooth muscle contraction. Thromboxanes here are considered the blood clot promoter, so they increase platelet aggregation, and they also help constrict blood vessels and reduce bleeding, and they work in this antagonistic mechanism too. Prostacyclin, as we see over here. So now let's zoom in on the two major enzymes, COX1 and COX2, because this is where it gets interesting in drug development. COX1 is considered the housekeeping enzyme. Why do we say so? Because its function is that it's always present in most tissues to maintain normal bodily functions. And a very key factor is that it protects the stomach lining by producing mucus via prostaglandin E2 that we just talked about before. And it also helps regulate kidney function and blood clotting balance. Now, COX2 though is the one that's basically highly induced during inflammation, meaning it's usually inactive unless triggered by injury, infection, or stress. This produces prostaglandins that drive pain, fever, and swelling. So this is what we want to target without targeting COX1 as much, and this is very important in drug development. COX1, since COX1 helps protect the stomach, inhibiting it with uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin can cause stomach ulcers by reducing protective prostaglandins. This helps us bridge into our next topic, uh, NSAIDs and or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So now that we understand the cyclooxygenase pathway, we are going to be talking about a class of drugs that you might be very fl uh, familiar with. And what better way to start than with one of the most famous non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, aspirin. So I'm going to be drawing here aspirin for visualization's sake. Uh, it is also called acetylsalicylate. So before modern medicine, actually, fun fact, is that people used to chew on the bark of the white willow tree, and they noticed that it actually helped with pain and inflammation. At the time, they didn't know why, but today we know because it blocks cyclooxygenase enzymes. And the actual, actually, the active ingredient in the tree bark is salicin, which our body converts into salicylic acid, which is also the precursor to acetylsalicylic acid, or aspirin, as we see above here. So what's bad about about aspirin or what's good about it is that it is a non-selective drug and it blocks both cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 non-selectively or non-discriminately and in the active site it helps acetylate the serine residues of these cyclooxygenase enzymes however because of its non-selective mechanism of action we already stated that it was bad if it blocks COX1 because it causes stomach ulcers and that's not ideal however it is good in the fact that it blocks cyclooxygenase 2 which is the one that deals with inflammation and pain so Going on to the next type of um, 
uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Other common ones are like ibuprofen, which I'm drawing right here. If you notice, there's a lot of uh, benzene rings. It is also non-selective, meaning it blocks both COX-1 and 2. And a common uh, thing for ibuprofen, you could see it as Advil or Motrin. And essentially, it is uh, a f like a good tip. You could use it before... Um, period cramps if you know you have your period coming up and it uh, prevents uh, dysmenorrhea because it blocks the prostaglandins that cause these uterine contractions. However, don't be taking too much of it as overuse can lead to stomach ulcers and kidney damage as we said before. And now I am going to be drawing here fluoribuprofen and naproxen. Naproxen is also called Aleve. This one right here I'm drawing is naproxen. And naproxen is basically similar to ibuprofen in its mechanism of action, but it has a longer half-life, essentially meaning it lasts longer in the blood. Its uses are that it's ideal for chronic inflammatory conditions like arthritis, and essentially has the same risks as ibuprofen. You don't want to overdose or overuse it, as it could cause stomach ulcers and kidney damage long-term. Now here, I have fluoribuprofen. And we notice something unique about fluoribuprofen in that the uh, the structure has this fluorine atom here. So this is also another non-selective NSAID, but slightly more potent than the ones I mentioned before. And the fluorine atom actually helps uh, with drug absorption and metabolism. So its uses are like common for arthritis and dental pain, as we said, with arthritis with naproxen or Aleve as well. So what makes these all non-selective? It has to do with actually the shape or the size of the molecules. They're both they're all small enough to fit in both cyclooxygenase one and cyclooxygenase two enough to inhibit both of them, and this is a problem. So why is blocking cyclooxygenase one a bad thing? Circling back again on this, I'm going to draw a nice little stomach here. We could see him sad or dead kind of because he is bleeding. He has stomach ulcers, and you do not want to be internally bleeding. So blocking too much of COX one will prevent that mucus regeneration of the stomach lining and cause bleeding. However, it is good in the sense that it also targets COX2. Here I'm drawing a shoulder joint and like you just hit a good shoulder day or something of the sort and you have a lot of inflammation, hence the red. So uh, these um, like Ibuprofen, for example, could help block some of that COX2 and decrease that inflammation that we feel in our shoulder joint due to what the stress and workout we just had. Moving on, now that we've identified the problem with non-selective non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, a group of very smart people said, why can't we just target selectively the cyclooxygenase 2? So let's make selective COX2 inhibit, uh, inhibitors. And a very popular one is uh, Celebrix or Celecoxib. And I'm going to be drawing the structure again here for visualization's sake. But essentially what these drugs are, they're able to selectively blo um, block the cyclooxygenase 2. And why? I have it circled right here, the benzene sulfan amide group. So this basically makes it too bulky of a group to be able to fit into COX1. However, it is good for COX2. So it fits right in that middle area and is too big for COX1, but is good for COX2. And that's good because we'll block our inflammation. But getting this uh, um, figure here that I referenced from my biochemistry professor, uh, Mr. Dr. Miesfeld, uh, we could see here that the selective COX2 inhibitors also partially inhibit prostacyclin synthase. It's like you can't ever have something good on its own. And the problem with this is that it increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Why does it do that? We circle back to prostacyclin. What do prostacyclins do? They usually decrease blood clotting. So if we decrease prostacyclins, we end up increasing bl uh, blood clotting indirectly. And by increasing blood clotting indirectly, we now ha have a higher risk of heart attack and strokes by having those um, blood clots or excessive thrombosis basically happening in either your coronary arteries or carotid arteries and just cutting off oxygen and blood supply to your brain and heart, very vital organs. And this is actually a huge is uh, issue before when one of the first uh, COX2 inhibitors, Vioxx or Rofecoxib, was actually linked to thousands of heart attacks and it was actually pulled back from the market in 2004. Celecoxib, however, is still used today, but with a black box warning for cardiovascular risks. So with any type of drugs, the dose is the poison. And as a good note to end things off for the video, and... Um, there essentially is no perfect drug in evidence-based medicine. It is all about balancing the benefit versus the risks. 
And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to like, comment, and share, and press that subscribe button, and I'll see you guys in the next video.